tonight. And if any of you have uh, been to some of the talkbacks at McCarter Theater, I know that you're familiar with Paula Ellickson, who is the Artistic Engagement Manager at McCarter. I've been to several of those discussions, and Paula, you do such a great job in those discussions and really um, encouraging such great dialogue. So thank you so much for being with us tonight, and I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thank you, John. And um, thank you to the New Jersey Historical Commission um, for this opportunity to moderate tonight's panel. Um, thank you, Bonnie and Todd and Ryan and John, uh, for joining us here tonight to engage in conversation about your theaters, about your work, and this compelling topical pairing. Um, and thank you, um, wonderful intrepid audience, um, theater enthusiasts, no doubt, who believe that theater is indeed popular. Um, I'm so thankful to you. You're very popular with me this evening, um, and we're happy to have you here. Um, now, I would be remiss if I didn't send greetings and regrets from Emily Mann, the artistic uh, director and resident playwright at McCarter Theater. Um, she had long ago scheduled an engagement on this day and was not able to plan around it to attend tonight. So she sends her warmest regards um, to her colleagues on the panel, to um, John and everyone from the Theater Alliance, certainly to the folks at the New Jersey Historical Commission, um, and uh, uh, and to you, the audience. Um, she's grateful to have been invited to participate and embarrassed that she couldn't participate, especially given that the event is happening literally across the street from where we've been living. Um, so uh, her best um, to you, of course. Now, before I provide some informational introductions or formal introductions to each of our distinguished members of the panel, I'd love to do a quick survey um, of you just to find out um, what your relationship is to the represented uh, theaters tonight, so we'll just start. Um, uh, could you raise your hand if you're a subscribing patron or you've attended two or more productions at Passage Theater? Yay! Great! Yay! Thank you! <laughs> Wonderful. Um, if you're a subscribing patron or have attended two or more uh, productions, oh, I should raise my hand too for that Yay. one, sorry. Uh, uh, to Two River Theater, yeah. <laughs> raise your hand, and I'll raise my hand to that. Great. Um, could you raise your hand if you are a subscriber or have attended two or more uh, performances at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey? Wonderful. And finally, if you would raise your hand, if you've attended, uh, if you're a subscriber or attended two or more performances at Paper Mill Playhouse. Could you raise your hand if you've raised your hand for all four? Yay! Yay! Do we have a door prize? Yeah. For my friend here, great. Um, I do see a number of McCarter interns in the audience and um, McCarter patrons as well and subscribers and donors as well, so grateful to have you here. Are any other theaters represented by audience members? George Street, welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you. All right. Um, it's my great honor now to turn to our panelists for this evening, and I would like to give you formal introduction if you don't mind. Not everybody has necessarily had the chance to read, but also I like to kind of brag about you um, a little bit if you don't mind. Um, and I'm going to start, um, I'll introduce an order of the age of institution, starting with, <laughs> starting with the oldest. And that is Paper Mill Playhouse, which was founded in 1934. Todd Schmidt has been the managing director of Paper Mill Playhouse since August of 2010. He was appointed at the start of Paper Mill's 72nd season and has been significantly instrumental in the theater's reattainment of its status as America's premier musical theater. Todd was previously, and if I get any details wrong, please don't I'll worry about it. Okay, great. So um, Todd, Todd was previously managing director at the George Street Playhouse. Um, the work he did there earned him record recognition as one of the 101 most influential people in New Jersey by New Jersey Monthly Magazine. Now, prior to becoming a New Jersey taxpayer, Todd was the executive producer of the nation's oldest professional resident summer theater, Peninsula Players Theater of Wisconsin. And prior to that, he directed and produced theater in Chicago, working with Chicago Shakespeare, Goodman Theater, and Apple Tree Theater. He received his undergraduate degree at Auburn University, War Eagle. War Eagle. <laughs> Okay, there many fans there. Yes, excellent. <laughs> and he earned an MFA in directing from DePaul University's Goodman School of Drama. Todd is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the New Jersey Theater Alliance, and he serves on the board of Art Pride New Jersey. Touch met, ladies and gentlemen. 
uh, this, the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey was founded in 1963 as the New Jersey Shakespeare Festival. Bonnie J. Monty has been at the artistic helm of the Shakespeare Theater since 1990. In the course of 27 seasons, she evolved the theater into one of the most respected classical theaters in the country, gaining recognition for her successful revitalization of the institution and its development as one of America's leading training grounds for emerging classical theater artists. An amazing fun fact about Bonnie is that, and I hope this is right, <laughs> that she never directed Shakespeare before prof professionally when she became artistic director of the theater, correct. which is a great story. <laughs> um, she has now directed over 60 productions for the Shakespeare Theater, including numerous productions of Shakespeare's plays, works from the Russian classical canon, including Chekhov and Ostrovsky, and plays by Tennessee Williams, for whom she has a special affinity. Uh, before her appointment at the Shakespeare Theater, she was the casting director for Manhattan Theater Club, and prior to that, for eight years, was the associate artistic director at Williamstown Theater Festival, in Western Massachusetts. Bonnie received her uh, undergraduate degree from Bethany College in West Virginia and had a, has a conservatory degree in directing from the Hartman Theater Conservatory. She has an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters degrees from both Drew University and the College of St. Elizabeth. She also has received numerous awards and honors over the years and, and was named one of the most 25 influential people in the arts in New Jersey by the Star Ledger. Ladies and gentlemen, Bonnie J. Monty. It's a pleasure to meet you. Passage Theater was founded in 1985. I learned so much in preparing. Um, <laughs> artistic director Ryan Dominguez is in the midst of her first year as artistic director of Passage. Prior to her move to New Jersey, Ryan was immersed for six years in the Philadelphia theater scene, working with the Wilma Theater, Interact Theater Company, and play, Plays and Players Theater, and serving as producing artistic director of Sympatico Theater, which she co-founded with four other theater makers. Ryan received her undergraduate degree from Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania and earned an MFA in directing from the University of California, Irvine. While on the West Coast, she had the opportunity to work at the South Coast Repertory Theater, California Shakespeare Theater, and Utah Shakespeare Festival. Following the completion of her graduate work, she returned to Philadelphia and the Wilma Theater in the capacity of external relations director, where she spent two seasons engaged in development, fundraising, and donor relations, proving that time and variety of experience experience is everything. <laughs> Ryan Dominguez, everyone. Welcome. And finally, um, Two River Theater Company, which was founded in 1994. Artistic director John Diaz is now in his eighth year of leadership at Two River. In partnership with managing director Michael Hurst, he has brought new vitality to the theater, which has resulted in many exciting projects and artistic enterprises got that right so far. Yes, indeed, I read about them. <laughs> Prior to Two River, John worked for 12 years in a variety of capacities for the public theater and the New York Shakespeare Festival, including as associate producer and associate artistic director, working under both producer George C. Wolf and artistic director Oscar Eustace. There he was responsible for all aspects of play production. He also ran the theater's literary department, overseeing new play workshops and productions of the classics, and directed and taught in the public's Shakespeare lab. Also previously, John co-founded Affinity Collaborative Theater, a production company dedicated to bringing daring new works from around the world to New York, and was founding artistic director of the Playwrights Realm, an off-Broadway company which produces new plays by emerging artists. John received his undergraduate degree from George Washington University and an MFA in that was hard to find out. Dramaturgy? dramaturgy. In dramaturgy. Um, I saw your thesis. I mean, your dissertation. Oh, wow. Or thesis, sorry. Yeah, it's online. <laughs> uh, from, from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, War Eagle, whatever the version of that is for the... Minuteman. Minute, right. Go Minuteman. <laughs> he has taught at New York University in Yale and currently teaches in the graduate theater program at Columbia University. Ladies and gentlemen, John Diaz. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to have you all. A quick word on format. I've prepa prepared questions for our panelists. Um, as the servant of two masters this evening, um, both the New Jersey Theater Alliance and the New Jersey Historical Commission, my super objective is to celebrate, cultivate, and promote um, the artistic missions of uh, these four wonderful representative theaters and the art being made under the guidance and direction of our four accomplished and interesting theatrical leaders. 
The objective of the panel, of course, uh, remains a lively discussion about popular culture in relation to the theater. Um, I'll engage the panelists with my questions for about 40 minutes max, I promise, and then we'll turn the discussion over to your questions and comments for them. A brief word on terms, and that is because in the preliminary conference call <laughs> with um, John McEwen and Sarah from uh, the Historical Commission um, with the panelists, it was decided that it would be a good idea to establish early on a working definition of popular culture. <laughs> yes. I feel the same way. Great. Um, as you might ima imagine, for every book I cracked and every essay I accessed, the following is noted, quote, the term popular culture holds different meanings depending upon who is defining it and the context of its use. So it's the source of much um, argument, especially sociological and philosophical. Uh, the man who literally wrote the book, the textbook on cultural theory and popular culture, John Story, emeritus professor of cultural studies at the University of Sunderland in the UK, offers six possible ways to define popular culture um, and four definitions for the term popular itself. Popular, well-liked by many people. Inferior kinds of work, as in vulgar, coarse, or unrefined. Work deliberately setting out to win favor with the people and culturally, culture actually made by the people for themselves. Stories, definitions of popular culture, before your eyes glaze over, I promise I'm almost <laughs> done, include culture, which is widely favored or well-liked by many people. Culture, which is left over after we have decided what is high culture. <laughs> <laughs> Mass culture or, and these are his words, a hopelessly commercial culture. Culture which originates from the people for the people. The fifth one goes into Marxism, and it's about opposition and resistance, and the sixth involves a debate on postmodernism. We won't go there. So for this conversation, I envision that tonight we will likely directly or indirectly touch on all of those definitions, um, which I feel like is appropriate. So we'll leave it there for now. I have another definition, but I think I think we'll leave it loose if that's cool with y'all. Okay, questions at last. Um, I thought we might begin by actually letting the panelists speak um, and laying a foundation of knowledge um, and familiarity with Paper Mill, with the Shakespeare Theater, with Passage and Two River by having you each share the mission of your respective theaters. And if you'd tell us a little bit about the makeup of, of your community or communities and uh, the audience that you serve. Bonnie, can we start with you? Sure. Um, well, I'm going to read our mission statement because um, we just rewrote it about a year and a half ago and it's quite lovely. Uh, <laughs> the artists and trustees of the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey bring the dramatic masterpieces of the past to dynamic new life in order to inspire our present lives as well as future visions for the world. We are a teaching theater fervently dedicated to providing transformative experiences through the live performance of the classics. We integrate education and learning into all of our endeavors while promoting literacy, a culture of enlightenment, a dedication to excellence, and a keen awareness of how the arts are a necessity to the health of the collective mind and soul of any great civilization. So that's our mission. Very nice. <laughs> very, very, very unpopular culture kind of mission, yes. um, Who do you popularly serve? So we serve, we actually serve two different kinds of constituents. Um, in terms of the work on stage, we basically serve uh, the tri-state region, obviously with, the, with um, the larger portion of our audience coming from northern New Jersey and about 12 to 15 percent now from New York City, which is great. Um, uh, and we serve in total about 100,000 people a year, but about 45,000 of those people are the other half of the constituents we serve, and those are kids. And we serve kids uh, all up and down the East Coast. We have one of the largest touring companies for, uh, that brings Shakespeare to students. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic region, so we'll be as far south as uh, North Carolina and as far north as uh, the Maine, right up near Canada, um, with the bulk of the students that we're serving from New Jersey, New York, uh, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, uh, the, the immediate kind of tri-state region. So, um, so that means that our student uh, audiences are very diverse, um, from all kinds of backgrounds, all ethnicities, um, urban, suburban, uh, rural, 
but our main stage and outdoor stage audience is uh, mostly a, a kind of, what if, you know, the metropolitan region kind of audience and a fairly sophisticated theater going audience since uh, we are very close to New York City. So is that kind of yeah, encapsulate? Perfect, yes. Great. Thank you. Todd. So I will also read. Uh, Paper Mill Playhouses, the mission of Paper Mill Playhouse is to enrich, entertain, and inspire our audience and our students as the nation's premier musical theater. We foster a creative environment for advancing the art form, educating students, and developing future theater lovers while providing access for all. Our vision, which is the next step of our mission statement, is vision of Paper Mill Playhouse is to be internationally recognized as the leading theatrical incubator where new and reimagined musicals and innovative education programs are cultivated. Paper Mill Playhouse is the place where artists, theater lovers, and students come together to realize their creativity and be inspired by the theater's unmatched passion and commitment to excellence. Our audience um, is similar to the Shakespeare audience, I think. We cover the kind of entire metro area and really the entire state. Um, we have patrons who come from all over the state to see our work and a good portion from New York City and Staten Island, actually, where they find it easier to get to Paper Mill than into the city. Um, our education programs serve the entire state through um, the Rising Star program, which is kind of the Tony Awards for high school musical theater programs throughout the state, a longstanding program. We have a big summer conservatory. We have regular kind of theater after school classes as well as un adopt a school program which goes into underserved schools for a kind of four year residency with a group of kids taking them from their freshman through their junior year in all kinds of places, Newark, Elizabeth, Rahway, and others. We serve uh, about 300,000 people a season who either come through our doors or participate in our education programs. Okay. Hello. Um, Passage Theatre Company is committed to the creation and production of socially relevant new plays and community devised arts programming that transforms the lives of individuals and community. Um, we primarily serve people from the city of Trenton, many people from Princeton. Um, we actually get a pretty decent Philadelphia audience because we're pretty close. Um, our uh, makeup is, uh, we do have a, our, our main stage programming is a, is a lot of adults. Um, of uh, a lot of different races, backgrounds, cultures, things like that. Um, our education program has been primarily serving high schools for the past 22 years, um, but we are uh, currently piloting our, our um, elementary education program. I'm really excited about that with Christina Sykes Academy and are uh, at the beginning of um, developing a program for university students with Ryder University. So we're expanding educationally and hopefully with our main stage audience as well. I'll continue the tradition. Um, Yay. <clears throat> so uh, we create at Two River Theater, we create great American theater by developing and producing new works and world masterpieces that most richly direct our gaze to the life of the human spirit. We cultivate an audience that cherishes the intimate joy of theater, enriched when shared by a community of others. Uh, so our, our community that we uh, serve and, and, uh, and commune with um, does is sort of ge geographical and is mainly in the Monmouth Ocean, Middlesex, Mercer County. But we too have a reach that uh, spreads across the state and into New York City. We also have a lot of Staten Islanders who come. Um, and I would say our audience uh, is is what would be called traditional, which is something we may unpack together up here. Um, I would say probably middle-aged and over and middle-class up. Um, but we also um, have uh, a, a growing audience among a few different communities. Our younger adult audience um, is growing in, in, in good ways. And, uh, and Red Bank, New Jersey, which is in Monmouth County, um, over there by the shore, uh, itself has a tradition of a couple of different communities um, that the theater is making inroads into and making good relationships with in the African-American community that has always been in Red Bank and in a fairly new Latino uh, community, which is mostly made up of uh, fairly recent Mexican immigrants. So, Great. Thank you. That gives us a great foundation. 
I appreciate that. Um, from your bios, we've learned that each of you have worked um, closely with Shakespeare, but Bonnie lives and breathes the pro uh, and programs Shakespeare more days than not um, in every season at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. Bonnie, um, going to the word popular, as in uh, well-liked and admired, um, just how popular are Shakespeare's plays in, in the US today? Very, very popular. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the statistics, wherever you happen to read them, are all kind of worded slightly differently, but I think the general consensus is that Shakespeare has never experienced more popularity than he is experiencing right now, particularly in the United States. And I'm pretty sure uh, that there is a statistic out there that says that uh, he is not only the most produced Shakespeare in America, but more Shakespeare is produced in America than anywhere else in the world, including England. And uh, so for as much as we may feel on many days and, and kind of bemoan the fact that um, we are trying to sell what often feels like a, a, a not particularly popular product if one compares it to something like, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, th things that are, uh, you know, what is the new big thing everybody's doing, the gaming and, you know, uh, where thousands and millions of people show up to, to play video games or something. Yes. Anyway, um, but, but the actual truth is that Shakespeare is indeed doing very, very well um, and is uh, quite uh, infused throughout the culture of um, American theater going. Could you um, talk about um, how and why Shakespeare spe specifically has survived and thrived um, in the way and perme permeated our culture and how he continues to remain so popular? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, the, uh, the guy, as Harold Bloom said, kind of has defined what it means to be human, and that does not change. And so I think that the stories that he tells us, that, I mean, they, are, they have become classics because they are eternal, they are universal, they speak to all of us, they unite all of us, and um, they never get dated or old. And they are constructed in a way that um, I, I don't know any other playwright who has the ability to literally transform and uh, those plays lend themselves to every single solitary uh, time and age through which they have passed. And um, uh, the theater artists that attack them and that engage in them uh, are, are, are constantly shifting the way we do them and the way that we approach them so that they never ever uh, stay anything but very modern. I think um, that's why. Anyone else on the panel is welcome to kind of dig into that question as well. Well, it's, a huge, back. it's a huge question, yeah. Um, I mean, I think Bonnie uh, has a, I would say, I mean, if, if you'll allow me, um, a, um, a, a, a sort of treasured position, um, having really created and sustained uh, a, a, a way to keep that Shakespeare alive and popular with the work that she does. I struggle at uh, Two River, frankly, um, around these things, and I think uh, I think it has to do with some of the other aspects about why Shakespeare is seen to be popular. Um, I think unpacking some of that popularity is what leads to some trouble for me with my audience because I hear from people things like that we all know in some ways you know, they have a very complicated relationship if they have one at all or if they want one at all with Shakespeare because they felt like he was crammed down their throats in school and that that um, the sort of popularity is has more to do with its sort of ubiquitousness in their lives or, or its presence and importance in their lives, but their relationship to how they interact with it is, is vexed at best in some ways. So... Um, I think I, I love, I'm, and I'm with Bonnie, and I, I totally agree. And I'm, I also love looking at the sort of surveying the nation at large in terms of our relationship to theater currently. And there's there are more wonderful Shakespeare festivals doing amazing things across this country, and more and more people going to them in large numbers. It's really really great. But if you haven't cultivated that, I feel like as a theater, if you haven't um, taken the audience along and, and kind of helped them get over some of those things the populism sort of feels like it hurts some audiences, in my experience. But. How do you cultivate 
how if you're not Bonnie. <laughs> um, it's really, really hard. It's really hard. Um, this is being videotaped, which I hate because I, I say things that I, I will regret. But it's like I'm struggling. Right, we're struggling right now to put together our season for next year. I, when I came to Two River, I said to the board and others that I would love it if we could make a commitment to doing one of Shakespeare's plays every year. There are 30-something of them, um, and they're all, to my mind, worth doing and l worth investigating over and over again because they're just so rich. They're, they're basically, to my, I think, more than understanding what is human. I think they help us understand what is infinity, actually, um, and so we can continually be exploring them. And, um, and, and over the seven, eight years that I've been programming seasons there, it's sort of because some of the pressure I get, it's kind of become a thing where I will feel like I can get to do one every other year. Um, and even that is getting harder. Uh, and what I thought was that we could be doing all different kinds of productions and finding different ways for different audiences to find their way into it. Um, and it's just sometimes hard to get them to come at all, to get that thing going with them. So um, I, think, I yeah. think it might also have to do with when an audience member is introduced to Shakespeare. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times um, people that I speak to um, aren't introduced to Shakespeare until high school, mm -hmm. college, some of them. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. that's a hard transition. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've been, if, if your parents or whoever have been reading Shakespeare to you when you're younger, um, it, you're eased into it in a different way. I, I find that people that are introduced to it so much later in life almost view it as a different language, which it's not, mm -hmm. but if you haven't become familiar with it, it can be difficult. So I think it, it, it really starts in the schools as mm -hmm. well and in our educational programming. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you know, with the educational programming, you do what, what you find, um, but just in my experience, I, I, I think talking about popular culture, it depends on when you uh, show them that culture. Mm -hmm. We, that's one of the things, actually, yeah. that um, has we have succeeded with at Two River. We started a program called Little Shakespeare, which um, we started it by um, by uh, turning one of our uh, high school education programs into a program where these high school students would perform a what we call little production of Shakespeare, a little mm -hmm. Shakespeare that is uh, paralleling the big production of Shakespeare that we're doing on the stage, and they. To put the show on for a, an audience of their peers and middle schoolers, and that has been kind of amazing for these kids. And I feel like if there's anything that I'm doing strategic or smart in that is is getting these kids having more, um, you know, that that more uh, immediate relationship with Shakespeare uh, in that way in the start of their their yeah. relationship with it. Yeah, so, I mean, so we 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 find that um, children have absolutely no problem understanding yeah. Shakespeare yeah. whatsoever, yeah. and no matter the age, yeah. um, if it is presented clearly and, um, yeah. uh, and and with clarity in many, many kinds of ways, but yeah. certainly in terms of behavior and the delivery of the language. But And if the story is told clearly, they get yeah. it. And they don't just get the basic plot. They get incredible subtleties. I, I was actually, I, I went up to Connecticut uh, to see a performance of our Shakespeare touring company, which was doing the Scottish play for uh, for a school that my brother uh, is the administrator at, and uh, it's um, it's a charter school. It is seventh, eighth, and ninth graders, um, 99.9% .9 of who are from very um, uh, economically challenged families, uh, uh, all black and Latino kids, uh, not particularly easy lives, very troubled kids. And I watched them get, mm -hmm. without question, unbelievable subtleties in the relationship as it was deteriorating between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. And at one point, uh, uh, he spur Macbeth spurned Lady Macbeth, and all of these kids who have had almost no exposure to Shakespeare whatsoever, all went, ooh. <laughs> so they, I mean, they were getting even little tiny things. And I think that we under estimate often to to our own detriment um, the ability of particularly young people that if you throw a great story in front of them they're going to get it mm -hmm. if you tell it clearly and um, and with passion and energy yeah can I, uh, just to pick because you said this very important thing that I think I'm going to try to relate back to the popular culture part that the kids do get it um, and but I think what's important in there kids are more willing 
to, to get it. Um, what I've noticed about adults that's been really disheartening is this thing that I now try to take care of, which is I find audiences very much don't want to feel dumb. Right. They, 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 and I think that's, that has a lot to do with sort of popularity, like peop, audiences who, when they think they can go to something, that they're not going to feel like the thing is telling them that they're dumb. They're more comfortable and they're more attracted to it. And I think that's one of the things about Shakespeare is people assume that they're going to be made to feel dumb about it. Um, and See, and that's so interesting because we actually get that slightly negative reaction, not to any of the Shakespeare's that we're doing, uh -huh. but to when we produce work that is uh, from the um, Theater of the Absurd or mm -hmm. some of the more... Um, yeah. a, a two modern pieces and um, and they get uh, they don't want to feel dumb and then they get angry if yeah. they're made to feel dumb exactly. so what we've started doing which has been incredibly successful when we do produce a Pinter piece or Ionesco or one of those guys we do a talk back after every single performance mm -hmm. yeah. and that has been a real game changer for us and audiences have asked for more mm -hmm. of that so that's been really exciting it's a huge commitment mm -hmm. um, but it's exciting we yeah. started doing pre-show uh, what we call the inside story after we, um, we were doing travesties by Stoppard and audiences thought the play was smarter than they were but if we just give them a few tools yeah. they would get right over that with the speed bump of that yeah. so yeah. engagement right we have some engagers in the audience um, from the intern class um, it's one of the ways to help help people um, I guess ex accessibility is sort of where I'm going next so we might as well um, go there um, Bonnie and John um, have you had to deal with a perception that Shakespeare or classical works aren't accessible to everyone um, we're kind of talking about that right now and, and um, beyond talkbacks what other ways have you tried to address this with your audience <laughs> well, well I mean just to Piggyback on what you said, we the Two River Theater, even before I got there, had been doing this thing that we called before play, which is the same thing. Yeah. What did you call it? Inside story? We call it inside story. Yeah, so every night um, at the theater, there's somebody there from the theater who's leading some discussion and trying to help the audience find their way inside for every single performance of every single show that we do. So that's... Yeah helpful that's um, that's big yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. sometimes uh, the actual performers in the piece yeah sometimes we'll have actors do it sometimes we'll have local scholars or sometimes it'll be me or others um stephanie cohen does it a lot um but uh yeah that um and uh yeah and i think like the uh the whatever we can do with young people um, to kind of get them started in the hopes that, that when they get older. Yeah, if I may, I think, um, Ryan, sometimes when we encounter it in um, high school, if that's where we encounter it, it's on the page mm -hmm. and it's not lived and performed as it was intended to be performed. And we're sort of finding the same things, Bonnie. Um, we do classics residencies in the Princeton um, schools um, with six uh, with sixth graders and the way that we make Shakespeare popular is they do the plays there's Shakespearean language incorporated into these kind of reduced texts and then what we find is uh, their classmates their, uh, that are younger than them in third and fourth grade can't wait till it's their turn to do right. Shakespeare and so the fear gets erased completely yeah. um, and it's something that people want to vie for. They can't wait to play that character. Yeah, right. yeah they can't wait to die on stage. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, John, um, you're directly involved with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival's um, uh, Play On project as a dramaturg. Um, would you define what a dramaturg is in case there are folks in the audience who are still iffy on that one and I'm going to take notes while you do that oh and talk a little bit about um, play on if you would. But that's so unfair. You're asking me two really controversial and provocative <laughs> questions. Is that okay? Um, um, <laughs> and, and I'm just going to say that if you want a violent opinion about it, just okay. yeah. move that uh, yes. <laughs> at some point. Right. Exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, well, so a dramaturg um, is, uh, uh, you know, a uh, a collaborative person in the process of making theater that in my life has had much to do with uh, a focus on texts and playwrights and what playwrights do and how a play works and trying to be uh, somebody in that process of, of uh, creating a play from new or making figuring out how a play works uh, for the process of putting it on that just contributes collaboratively 
to that. Um, in, in the world of new plays, I often see a kind of analog to a really good, hopefully, editor, book editor, somebody that a writer can kind of bounce off of in that way, and somebody who helps somebody to tease out what it is that it seems that person is wanting to do. Anyway, that, that's dramaturg. And then, um, so, and uh, um, we're talking about this, Paul's talking about this uh, project at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, which has gotten very controversial. You may have read a few things in the New York Times about it. Um, if Probably if you push a button on Bonnie, she will <laughs> um, kind of explode about it. But, but um, to try to say it simply, some um, very wealthy man out in Oregon or who's associated with Oregon Shakespeare, uh, has his own issues around um, how Shakespeare uh, can continue to be immediate and alive for audiences as we move through time. And as I understand it, and this is the kind of the thing that interested in me, why, which is why I did get involved, is he has, there is this notion um, that with a lot of the great classics that go way back in time, there are a lot of cultures around the world who don't, who, you know, not, not in the language that that text was written in, who have the opportunity through translations, uh, always to bring those plays into a kind of contemporary, to a contemporary language and into a contemporary uh, culture's life. And the idea, I think, was, hey, just like, you know, the Germans have Goethe and Schiller, um, and uh, and we Americans, if we want to produce Goethe and Schiller, which sadly we don't, but if we did, um, we would have the opportunity of translating those from that time and that language into a contemporary American vernacular. Um, and then, say, the Germans and the French and all kind of the Japanese, all kinds of people around the world have this same relationship to Shakespeare in that they get to kind of keep re encountering Shakespeare through new translation. So at Oregon, they thought, we, why don't we try that? but just in a kind of, with an American vernacular, just kind of make it, you know, for, for the various cultures in America to try to do that same thing. Um, and it is, it is something that I think a lot of people get very anxious about its uh, assertion, perhaps, in people's minds, that what they're saying is that Shakespeare's actual language can't be made to feel immediate. And I don't think they're saying that, Certainly, I don't say that about it in my involvement in it. Um, and one of the things that happened, I'm working with, you know, I, I was invited in because this one playwright was asked to do one of these translations with whom I have worked before. And so she asked, she was asked who did she want to bring in as a dramaturg, and she asked me, and I like her, and I thought, oh, this could be fun. And, and it's been interesting to be part of the process because essentially, and because she, she has the same skepticism about the whole project that I do, um, but it's just been interesting to watch this playwright and be involved with her in this way in how she's trying to make the translation and just how much more it teaches you while trying to do that about what Shakespeare is doing. Um, and I feel like that, just as a, an exercise to engage with the language in a much more visceral way, or in a visceral way, different from the other visceral ways we try to do it, is an interesting and productive exercise. I personally am curious to see whether anybody would really ever produce these plays and or why they would. Um, but um, yeah. Great. So I talked too much, but you, you, you well, let me, opened a big I, thing. I will just say yeah. on the side of that, yeah. that it is fascinating to read the uh, original text and compare the artistry uh, with uh, with Shakespeare, uh, against Shakespeare, our Shakespeare community reading group. Any folks in the in the house here? No, but we we took the first text, uh, Timon of Athens, uh -huh. and uh -huh. compared. And uh -huh. I gave them the opportunity. We read comparative scenes, and then I said, "Okay, next time, next month when we meet, wh which one would you like to read?" And they're like Shakespeare, uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah, because they yeah. they wanted the challenge. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, and they wanted um, the beauty, mm. uh, even in Timon, which yep. is a little challenging to say that. But yep. Yep. so I, I will be on the side. Bonnie, did you want to, or Todd or Ryan, wade in quickly and then we'll yes, move Yes, I on. will be very quick. I, I mean, I, I have 14 different massive arguments that I can make, but <laughs> um, I, I will tell you that I actually feel that it's criminal. I think it's raping Shakespeare. I have read some of these things. I think that they are 
first of all, they're they're not tr they're not they're translating modern English to modern English, which seems somewhat ludicrous to me. Um, but it, it goes against everything that certainly my theater stands for, which is the preservation and 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 the celebration of Shakespeare as a, as an artist from the past who is as as absolutely resonant and relevant as he ever was, um, and the poetry is the best in the world. So why are we deleting it in these translations? If they called it something else, That's I would it. be okay, maybe. <laughs> but they are gonna, there's going to be people who read these things and think that that's Shakespeare. And I read I a big so. hunk of the Pericles, and it was garbage. And for a young person or an old person, whatever age person, to pick that up, because it says Pericles by William Shakespeare, translated by whoever, they're going to think it's Shakespeare, and it's not. And all of the stuff that makes Shakespeare so brilliant and so fantastic and is gone. Why are we doing this? And so uh, those are my main arguments. <laughs> I'm going to back away slowly. That's okay, yeah. I, I would just say he's not lost, though. I mean, but I, I I do agree that the word translating, <laughs> yes, it would be hard. Um, but um, I do um, I do. I think it is about accessibility, though, but it is also an experiment. I think but, it is an experiment. But if you want accessibility, there are a billion good guides to every Shakespeare play that exists, which would be just as helpful and would still allow you to enjoy Shakespeare as opposed to the... What's the word? Uh, the, 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 what do you call a painting that's been... Uh, forgery. Yes. A forgery. forgery. Yes. Forgery. Yeah, thank um, you. I mean, I would say, not that I entirely disagree with you, but I would also say one of the things, I mean, this sounds like a, a provocative thing, I'm sure, too, but uh, one of the things I appreciated about it all is it, 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 it actually put the issue out into a wider public in a kind of populist way. It made it into the editorial pages of the New York Times. Yes, it did. Which is fantastic for Shakespeare. You know, it might have been terrible for the project, but it's really great for Shakespeare. Um, and for this discussion, I think the discussion is worth having. I think um, I think we, we do, it, it is, and that there are people interested in it, and that, um, you know, for whatever reasons, things like No Fear Shakespeare and that kind of thing, are there's a market for it, and it's happening. And um, I do think we, we should just be richly discussing all of this, um, and it's brought it up. But least. because it does so. make the pages of the Times and things like that and many other publications, I mean, to some degree, that points to the fact that theater is very much a part of the popular culture. Exactly. Right? Good. Which brings us right back yeah. to where we're at. <laughs> All right. Segway. Thank you. Yes. Stake that claim. <laughs> Todd, how are yes. you? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Paper Mill did a Shakespeare play once. <laughs> what was it? Uh, we did a production with McCarter's before I was there. They did a, a co-pro of Midsummer with, with McCarter, which I think was, I heard was fantastic and wonderfully done. Is this the Groove Lily? Yes. Okay, uh -huh. great. And did really well at McCarter, and when it got to Paper Mill, the audience left at intermission. <gasps> so I think it's just a question of trying to build your audience and mm -hmm. your brand around what you are, and... And manage expectations. And manage expectations, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So I conducted a rather unscientific study, as I wrote you about, um, via the pop culture, cultural technological marvel called Facebook. <laughs> I asked my friends and my family. Um, my wife never responded. She's in the audience today. <laughs> uh, some of who are theater practitioners. Um, uh, some are academics. Others who are not. Others who are not theater people at all. The following question: uh, One, do you consider questions? Do you consider theater to be popular culture in the present day? And two, because I was thinking about literature, is literature, books, novels, popular culture? And the general consensus was, with few exceptions, that musicals are popular culture, but theater is not. Mm -hmm. And I noted in my notes <laughs> to Todd um, that if yes. any of you grew up with the popular cultural show Zoom. Um, yes. At all, yeah. right? This is a Fanny Dooley, right? Fanny uh -huh. Dooley loves Shakespeare, but she hates hey. theater. Yes, that's right. <laughs> sorry. Or, hey, loves musicals, I'm sorry. Yeah. Loves musicals, but she hates theater. Could you talk about the popularity of musicals as an art well, form? Well, I think musicals uh, as an American art form has been popular since their inception, and because they're looked at, and I think for me and for probably many of us in this audience, as kind of our gateway into the performing arts, 
you know, my mother didn't take me to see Shakespeare. She took me to see Mary Poppins. So, you know, there's a way you're introduced to the art form. And I think because of all the things that musicals do, and primarily because of music and lyric, it's like Shakespeare, and to me, it is transformative in the way it can speak to people in a direct way that gets beyond the idea that this isn't approachable or understandable. I mean, some of the biggest things that we have had at Paper Mill recently are not necessarily, I mean, they're very popular, like Les Mis, but Les Mis is a very dense you know, thing about a, a moment in time in French history, um, but has become remarkably popular. I think musicals and many plays, and I'll let somebody else argue on the play side, there's many plays that we know are all, all part of our popular culture, but musicals, I just made a little list as I was, as we were talking about it and thinking, okay, you know, I could, I, if I went, <laughs> yeah. West Side Story. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> some. You know, and if you go through Oklahoma, 1943, Carousel, being redone on Broadway now, 1945, West Side Story, 1957, Cabaret, 1966, Hair, 68, Company, 70, A Chorus Line, 75, Eight Misbehaven, 78, Evita, 79, Beauty and the Beast, 94, The Producers, 2001. You skip cats. I skip cats. Okay. Popular. <laughs> that was important but popular. to me. Popular. Uh, in the Heights, 2008, and Hamilton, 2015. I was trying to find things that looked, felt to me like seminal moments in popular culture. That something that happened in a musical and originated in most of these cases in a musical was transformative to pop culture, to popularity. They are immensely popular, and they had incredible impact at that time and continue to have. So, I mean, I find, I, I mean, I find all of theater to be pop culture in my world. I mean, you can't talk about Death of a Salesman or Streetcar or, you know, you know, you know, there's so many things you could pick out that are all of us know. And when you start working on these, and I, you find it all the time in this business, you start working on something and all of a sudden you see how it's infiltrated everywhere. We did a West Side Story about a year, two years ago, I guess, at Paper Mill in a great production. But I was involved because my partner was in the last Broadway revival. And it was just phenomenal to all of a sudden to see all the, realize all the references from Shakespeare to West Side Story through Maria, you know, everything that people, people would make a joke that wasn't even about that moment in time, but it involved West Side Story. It was just part of popular culture. So if you talk about embedded things that we as a society all connect with and know and form some kind of common thread, I think musicals are certainly the groundwork in that. I don't think it's the only part of popular culture, but I think it's certainly, and you can't, you know, just Hamilton is now, you know, like one of these moments that has changed what's gonna happen. It and changes culture. culture. They be, they, there are certain pop culture phenomena <laughs> that are so extraordinary that they actually change our culture and become, and, and go beyond pop culture then. Yes. They move out of that category into a broader category. Yeah, and what are we saying, you know, we talked about this on the phone, what is pop culture? So if we're looking at, you know, the, the Warhol kind of taking a soup can and making it art, I don't think that's what these do. I think they go beyond that. And like Bonnie said, change the culture. Something that just reflects that moment in pop culture, I think it may be quickly forgotten. It pops like a balloon and yep. it goes away, yeah. Literally pops, yeah. Uh, would anyone else like to talk musicals? Because I know, John, you... you yeah, think? I mean, um, it's interesting, because um, you used the word that Bonnie used about it being transformative. And you, you said something early that made me think about this, about, you know, popular culture and its relationship to high art. I think you used that word. Um, and um, and I, it, it makes, just makes me think about how, what a moving target those definitions really are, what, how subjective it is. Because if you think about what, as popular as it is for us, what musical theater is, is it's incredibly artful. And it's synthetic. Uh, and it involves so many layers of things. And it asks us to do these crazy things that if you think about what is going on in your head and body when it's happening, when, when suddenly someone breaks out into song, 
in the middle of talking with somebody and you don't think that's weird. You just go with it. Or somebody's, uh, like the whole group of people just start dancing in some realistic street scene and you don't do, your, your mind, your soul, your heart knows exactly what to do with that. That to me is what Shakespeare's doing. If we, if we only, I mean, but musical theater was created for us and by us as Americans. So we were part of it's we're part of that transformative thing that it does. We're part of how it works in that artful way. But if we could do that same thing with things like Shakespeare or with things that we don't quite know in the same way, like new work, you know, if we would let ourselves just give over to that transformative thing and, you know, let ourselves, let our minds, our infinite minds do those things, do those crazy things, I think everything could be pop culture in that way. Um, I... I'm fascinated by um, a theater that primarily programs musicals, and I wonder, how do you sit down and create a season, um, Todd? I know that you're the managing director, but I'm imagining you're active in that. Mm -hmm. um, how does one program? I, I think it's, about um, some of our work where it's like, you know, we're, we want to give our audience a variety. Where do you even start? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you look for a variety within the form, and so we're always looking for that. And I think what's happened, the, trans, the, the transformational moments that have happened at Paper Mill recently have been going from what was viewed as kind of the great place to see the revivals of great musicals, because Broadway hadn't really grabbed that ticket yet. Um, and Paper Mill was seen in the 80s and 90s as the place to go and see Follies and all these other musicals and, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and what's transformed now is it's now the place to see the new musicals that are then might end up in New York or on the road or in other regional theaters. So we've certainly had to continually look to bring our audience along. I remember we had a very intentional season when we were losing millions of dollars a year and we decided to... <laughs> To, to do a season of, I, I can't, won't even remember them all now, but I know we opened with Chorus Line. And uh, um, they, were, they were all kind of blockbuster titles, but there's only so many of those. It's like Shakespeare. Yeah. You know, you're going to run out of West Side Stories, and this, even some of these lists are not going to sell anymore. But, you know, once you do Annie and West Side Story and the ones that you know will just prack in an audience, you, you're quickly out of those titles. So our challenge was how do we continue to reinvigorate this art form and this theater by bringing in new work. So this season we're doing, you know, four new works and Annie. Um, next season we're doing uh, four new work, four, well, kind of four new works, three new works, a Holiday Inn and Beauty and the Beast. So it's, and the audience has joined that journey with us in a huge way. You know, we've seen our subscription numbers, our single ticket sale numbers, everything is growing. And we we didn't know. We just decided, let's try this. What do we got to lose? We're losing money on South Pacific. Nobody really wants to see maybe another South Pacific, even though it's a great musical, but they, you know, we're, you know, right now you probably heard we're doing The Sting that's in tech and opens next week with Harry Connick Jr. Well, that's kind of a phenomenon. I mean, The Sting was already a title that was selling really well because it's based on a movie, the Paul Newman Robert Redford movie that was very popular in the 70s. And then when we announced Harry Connick Jr. playing the Paul Newman role, you know, it's like you can't get a ticket. Popular. Yeah, <laughs> popular. Yeah, yeah. Um, that might be the one musical that my wife will go see with me <laughs> because we both love The Sting so much. That's great. Hmm. I, I want to sort of in a moment segue into new work but um, I, before I do I know that Bonnie in the past you've um, uh, been able to program and direct a musical at uh, Shakespeare Theater John you do at least one musical ev every year and Ryan I, I read you want to introduce some musicals to Passage we've done one you have I don't even remember it's called move it and it's yours and it was done I don't know how many years ago, because I couldn't get the script from anybody, but we have done one, I've been told. But yes, we're hoping to do one in 2020. I'd love to hear a little bit about um, uh, what goes into, maybe for you, Bonnie, getting the opportunity to do that um, with um, in, in deciding what the programming is. John, um, what are the pr particular considerations of uh, and challenges of mounting musicals in the not-for-profit theater? So. Yeah, I mean, we try to, 
we, we love doing musicals. We, we keep very much in mind, we're going to do the ones Paper Mill won't do. Hmm. So, uh, so, particularly because we're so close to each other. But, I mean, so, so the, you know, our audience has been dying for us to bring Illyria back. Illyria is a musical based on Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Um, and we're dying to do that. And we probably will, either next season or the season after. Um, but we have to save up our money to do one because... Mm-hmm. For, I mean, it, we're already a theater where 90% of our shows are huge casts because of their Shakespeare or they're another classic. There are no two people classics. Um, well, <laughs> modern classics, yes, but not, you know. So it, Shakespeare didn't write a, you know, one man show. So uh, for us, it's, it's, it's often a, a financial concern. What, what, do we, what are we going to drop a Shakespeare in order to do a musical? And, and our, we have to, you know, keep the Shakespeare half of our audience very happy. So often it will be a musical that is based on a Shakespeare play um, or the ones that nobody else wants to touch for peculiar reasons, um, a Brecht musical, uh, you know, um, the, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, even something like Shakespeare in Love, which we produced last season, which is not technically a musical, but it's a play with a ton of music. Um, that was even, that was hard for us to, to manage. So. It's, it's largely a financial concern as much as anything. And that's because of all the uh, re- human resources required as well? Yeah. You okay. know, the minute you start adding musicians and there's different pay scales, you've got to have more ASMs, you've got to have different chorus things. Right. It's just a lot more money. It's a machine. Yeah. Big. Yeah. Yeah. We at Two River tried, we, we I, I very much wanted to infuse into the mission of the theater. Um, and, and I count um, the American musical as one of the greatest things that Americans have contributed to world culture. And so I think of those things as great world masterpieces. Um, and so we, we did want to integrate that in, as well as the other part of our mission, which is to create new work. So we have um, either done a, a, um, a classic musical. We did a production of Camelot and um, Funny Thing Happened on the Way of the Forum in my time there. Um, and, uh, and we've done a bunch of new musicals. But um, doing those classics, it's sort of, or any of them really, it's, it's, uh, it gets at what Bonnie's saying in terms of the complexities of it for us. You know, we have, we don't have a house as large as paper mills. We have, a, a, you know, two theaters, one 350 seats and 110. And so the economics are really, really hard to make sense of. Um, and uh, yeah, because once you do a mu- once you say you're doing a musical, you sort of double or triple. Uh, from what you might be doing with a play. You know, you've got your orchestrations, you have a choreographer that you don't, you know, I mean, it's got all kinds of things like that. Um, so, but um, they do, because of what we're talking about, it seems to me, they are an entry point for a lot of new theater audiences. Um, they do have that kind of populist thing about them just as as musicals. So um, I exploit, I want to exploit that in terms of developing an audience as well. So. Yeah. The, uh, just to jump in with something that just occurred to me that uh, happens in all of our theaters, which is the economics of what you can do and what you can afford to produce, because there is no technology that's going to eliminate the actor, their dresser, the stage manager, the guy on the rail who has to bring that scenery in, the carpenter who has to push that circuit scenery out, the musical director who has to lead the orchestra, the many players in the pit. We are such a hands-on human business that a light board has gotten made things easier, I guess, in terms of pushing a button and having a lot more fantastic effects happening, but it takes as many people as it ever did. There is no technology that is automating this business and making it less human. And the human costs on a musical, you know, we will have, if there's 27 people on stage, there are at least 27 people backstage, and usually more. And then there's probably 22 people in the pit. And so you add all those numbers up and it just exponentially gets more and more expensive. And then with unions and requirements and all of those things. Adding numbers up reminds me yeah. that I'm, <laughs> yes. so I'm going to um, just um, quickly ask a question of you relative to new work. How, um, not that you're necessarily looking for a popular audience, but you're looking to in- excite people about new works. Could you talk a little bit about the risks um, and the challenges and the joys of new works at Two River? Sure. Um, uh, 
Gosh, yeah. That um, may not have been well asked. Well, no, but. I mean, it's, it's it, there's a, it's a big question. I mean, the, you, you know, the, the theater, the, the history of the theater, of, of Two River Theater is, is one that um, had very much to do with its reason for being there, which was to bring kinds of theater to that part of New Jersey that had never exist, had existed there before and, uh, and really to introduce kind of great, great, great world plays. And, um, and so when I came to the theater eight years ago, the theater hadn't done a lot of new work. Um, and I just thought it was uh, that we had an opportunity. It was also, it's just the, the, the architecture there, these two theaters, one of them is, is a black box, which seemed to me just ripe for a place to develop new work and to develop an audience around that. Um, and so in my first season that I programmed there, we did a season of, I think it was eight plays, and uh, two of them were world premieres, and that had never been done in the subscription series before, and we were really nervous, um, and we thought people wouldn't come and or wouldn't choose to see the plays. And the the first play that we did um, was a play with a you know an, uh, just an unimaginable title called Seven Homeless Mammoths Wander New England," um, and it's a play about lesbian academics uh, up in uh, Western Massachusetts. Um, Whiskey. Yeah, um, and. Uh, and trying to save these these mammoths in this museum and uh and and you know we went out and we were clear about that because we also thought we don't want to get into trouble in our fairly conservative audience I man i don't know if you know about this but monmouth county is one of the most conservative counties in the state it's i think the reddest voting um county and um there's a lot of social conservatism as well as sort of political conservatism there and we were really really worried but it was amazing they everybody came all our subscribers chose that uh, and we actually had to add performances um, was it intrigue over the title itself that no makes me it was just um i mean it wasn't we didn't it wasn't boffo like yeah. we, we didn't sell it to millions of people but but there was i think um the thing that i wanted which was the thing that i kept trying to pitch was that you red bank could be involved in creating things that would be that could be meaningful to the culture of, of America and the American theater as, as we move on. You could have, you could play a part in that. You could be instrumental in that. And, and I think people started to believe me. And that, that playwright, um, I also, I wanted very much to move away from a thing that I had experienced a lot in my life in New York, which was this celebrity culture of actors. Um, I love actors, um, but I, I hate celebrity culture, um, and I, I distrust it deeply. And so I thought I would upend it, and I, I, my proposal was, let's make playwrights celebrities. Because um, I feel like playwrights are the reason I'm in the theater. Um, and, uh, and so that playwright who wrote that eventually became our playwright in residence, and she is a kind of celeb little celebrity in Red Bank. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that was... You absolutely okay. did. Thank you uh, so much. I am going to segue to you, Ryan, now, to put you on um, the hot seat. Uh, it's so wonderful to include you in this panel yeah. in your first year of artistic directorship, not Thank that you. you don't have um, the previous experience. Um, uh, I think I want to just start by asking you about the mission statement of Passage. It was an inherited it was. Mis mission statement. It was. Um, uh, uh, do you know the genesis of that vision, uh, the mission and the vision? And can yes. you talk about how uh, your personal artistic interest and experience aligned with that vision and mission? And then I'd love to project as to whether or not that will change mm -hmm. um, now that you've had sort of, you're having this year of observation <laughs> and listening yes. um, in the city of Trenton. So. Um, the mission, and, it's in, and specifically the vision, um, came from June Ballinger, who was here before me for 22 years. Um, June, for those of you that don't know her, is an incredible woman who uh, really sees theater, uh, especially Passage Theater, as a theater for everyone. And it was always June's goal to make our audience as diverse and as open as possible. And I, I, I think she's done an amazing job because I can say that our audience is incredibly diverse and um, we have, I mean, it's actually hard for me to put a finger on our audience because they are just from, you know, socioeconomics and, and uh, ethnicities and cultures, uh, we really have a mix and that's due to June. Um, my interest in uh, 
Passage's mission really stems from, I have a background in theater for social change. So um, when I co-founded Simpatico, for example, um, myself and the other four founding members, you know, we were interns at Portland Stage Company at the time, um, sat in a room and said, why theater? Like, why theater, really? Because we could have done a lot of things. Um, you know, at that point, yeah, I was yeah, 22. Yeah, yeah. I could have done anything. Um, but but, but, but uh, we did say, why theater? And, and, and the conclusion we came to is because we wanted to work specifically with the community. So when I you know, went into grad school, I ended up directing Brecht, as one would. And, um, and um, I became fascinated with companies like Cornerstone Theater. Um, I had done some work with Interact Theater, who's an incredibly, incredibly uh, politically aware theater company in Philadelphia. And so basically what happened was um, when I came across Passage and, and the mission and things, I thought, this is the work I've been doing. This is the work that, that I understand. Um, and so Passage, you know, there was a question for a while of whether we actually put the city of Trenton into our mission because that's how closely we work with the city of Trenton, the uh, government officials of Trenton, the, the other nonprofits of Trenton. Um, we decided not to because our audience is more than Trenton. Um, but, but we really do things in response to our immediate community. And just because that's, that's who I am, it was important to me. So that's where it came from. Do you have the vision there? Because I, your vision, yes, is, I have is, the a, vision. is a beautiful thing. Yes, And I, I would love vision. for you to read that sure. if you would. Um, at its best, theater transforms, inspires understanding of the rich diversity of the human experience, gives voice to the silent and dignity to the dispirited. Through the creation and production of theater, we chart a passage to grace in ourselves and others and throughout our community. That's, That's our great. Statement. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's all June right there. Uh -huh. That's great. Um, one last question to you before we segue out to the audience, but um, John, it was very important to John and I think to this panel that diversity was sort of one of the watchwords. Could you talk a little bit um, about uh, why diversity, inclusion, and representation is important to the stories we tell and the people who tell them and the people who we tell them to? Yes. Um, That's going to the popular of the people, populace. Well, you know, it's interesting because pop culture, one of the first questions I ask is, who's culture? Um, something that I've learned throughout my work is, you know, I think, well, everybody knows this, this, and this, and that's not the case. Um, I think the reason Hamilton was so big is that it was one of the first shows to actually cross cultures. Um, you know, it was the number one rap album, I think, for a while. Yeah. There's some snap. Yeah. Yay, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? Um, I, it, was a, it, was a, it started as a mixtape album, which is a popular form. Yeah, and, and, and so, you know, there were a lot of shows that were hip-hop shows before Hamilton. Um, but Hamilton did it in a way that everybody could access. Um, so, so to me, I, I think it's important that we're opening our audiences up not only to their own culture but to others. This is something that I think, it, it, it has to do with Shakespeare, it has to do with the musical. If you're not taught from a young age to have a thirst to understand other cultures, it's harder when you get older to do it. And I think um, as a theater that is a response to our society, we have to, we have to be the ones to help teach that. And we have to be the ones to help um, give people that in. And so, you know, when I look at the community of Trenton, when I look at, at the theater, when I look at the what's happening in the world right now, I person like as an artist, I feel like I have a responsibility to um, help people navigate those really tricky conversations and if not navigate them or fix them, but at least experience them and let them sit with them in a theater for two hours. So that's what I'm Amen, sister. <laughs> um, we're going to your questions. I have more questions, but relative to pop culture, but I'd love it if the best questions came from you. Do use the microphone to ask your question because we are recording. First Great. question. I guess to I'm my best, me. Phil Donahue. Um, thanks. This has all been really interesting. And I want to say I've really enjoyed at Two Rivers the August Wilson plays that I've seen there. 
my question to all of you is in terms of popular culture, and you sort of you mentioned a little bit of celebrity, but there are more celebrities on stage now, and as a draw, I think to get people to fill seats. And I'm wondering what your take is on all that. Do you, does it work as making and making theater more accessible? You don't seem to like it. Hmm. Thank you for your question. I, I'm happy to cast a celebrity if they are qualified. M my argument, and John may share part of this problem or not, I don't know. My problem with a lot of the, the use of celebrities on stage in New York theater right now is that they are using them to be a draw for ticket sales. But the celebrity is not trained in the theater. It does not have the chops, does not do justice to the play or the playwright's intention. And so we have all these mediocre productions that are getting tremendous you know, publicity and people focusing on them. And then the people go to the play because whoever famous person is in it, and then they are disappointed. And that is not a way to grow theater goers. That is a way to disappoint theater goers. So for me, in the big, big, big picture, this kind of celebrity worship tactic that everybody's using, certainly in the more in the commercial world than in the regional world, um, is not something that I'm interested in. I, as I said, I, will, I have cast celebrities, and I will continue to cast celebrities when it makes sense artistically. That's my take on it. Here, here. Hmm. We can't afford celebrities, so. <laughs> we, well, the good thing about, you know, we Local make them work for the same as everybody else, so yeah. The mirror may be available soon. Well, we have Grant Shout from Murphy Brown. Uh -huh. So he is, oh, our, yeah, yeah you did. he, he did. So he was, he was, he was great. He's great. <laughs> um, I'm wondering that uh, as you are planning seasons, if there's anything when you're interacting with a possible piece that might be interacting with a topic or a thing that's too popular, uh, like that's too much, like the conversation within it is, is too sort of full. And I don't mean sort of like um, superheroes, more like, uh, for example, uh, the president. Uh, there, you know, in the last year and a half, there have been plays and musicals and the public doing Julius Caesar in sort of the image and whether you sort of step back from that or you try to interact with that at all. Thank you for your question. Well, we did a play just a little while ago with superheroes in it. Uh, <laughs> it was and, really good. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. Um, and I actually didn't think of it as, I mean, we didn't program it because we thought it was going to be populist in that way. Um, I programmed it because I thought it was a really good play, and I thought it was a play that provided a really good entree uh, into a story from a particular place and time, uh, which involved this mainly Puerto Rican, but uh, sort of a larger Latino community in parts of Brooklyn that were being gentrified. And, um, and I thought it would be a story that would reflect a lot in our own neighborhood um, among our own audiences. So, and we thought what we were doing with that play was, in, if anything, attracting a young, our young adult audience that we were going after. It turned out that they couldn't even get in because the old people um, bought all the tickets first <laughs> um, because somehow they were interested in superheroes too, which was really weird. And they, they ended up really loving the play. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know, I, I think, I think I know the question you're asking, and and I wish that I could claim that I could I was that smart and strategic about trying to think of plays that would um, reflect immediately in that in that way about something like um, what's going on in our political culture or something. But we um, yeah. we, are, we just did um, a new comedy called The Outsider that yeah. was I think quite topical, not direct. There was not a Trump figure in it, but there was certainly Trump like qualities about um, a character in the show, more a Sailor Palin-esque probably, but um, it was it was intentional in the fact that we just, we loved the show and wanted to foster and get it seen and felt it was very topical and timely and presented a really great kind of argument about what kind of politician do you want in office. Um, we're, do, we're doing uh, all of the shows this season were chosen 
either to give people total relief and escape from what's happening <laughs> in the world or to very directly confront what's happening in the world. So um, the production that opens our season, Tartuffe, um, is very specifically <laughs> directed at our <clears throat> so-called president, yes. And, and we, uh, we are not engaging, uh, we're developing a piece right now that is um, interviews from our community about a rather political topic that came up last um, summer in Trenton. And so we are actually um, interviewing local officials, people in the community, artists, and, you know, trying to get, dig to the truth of what actually happened. Um, and so I think, you know, for us, <laughs> we could have backed away slowly from it, but we decided to help dig deeper and do it in a way that is um, investigative rather than one-sided. Um, so I can just say on the local level, we, we, just, we just have been deciding to dig deeper. It's all, I don't know if you guys feel that, it's just, it's hard to imagine, maybe I'm just too slow, but it's hard to imagine keeping up. It all happens so quickly. I mean, I pro, I'm programming a season right now that's going to happen starting next fall and go from a year from now. Who knows? what is going to be going on i mean yeah. who could have predicted That's been even do you know um I, i'm i'm fascinated to see what this david henry huang and janine tesori wrote a musical called soft power which is about which was a, they wrote it just on the verge of the election anticipating hillary's um you know presidency and the play is about that and they they thought they were going to be reflecting that um and well, they got that wrong, but the play is still moving, the musical is still moving forward. I'm interested to see how that, given that they thought they were going to be really speaking about a transformative moment of a woman in pre woman as the president, and, and so now what is that going to be is interesting. Hi, and um, I've gone to almost all of your theaters. I haven't been to Passage, I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. You'll, you'll come. come. You'll come. Um, you, ha you have you'll a go. chance. Yeah, we open but, May 3rd. <laughs> but I, my first, um, the only time, the first time I ever saw Shakespeare ever performed was on PBS. Mm. They used to do Shakespeare with Helen Mirren and all mm. those. It was awesome. Mm. And then I didn't see Shakespeare again until the early 90s when I saw Much Ado at McCarter. But anyway, well, how do you, how do you, I know Shakespeare Theater has an amazing, educational program amazing and i've heard about yours as well and but how do you compete against the common core curriculum the teachers are trying to shove mm -hmm. as much as they can into a day when they're teaching if you take a look at it i used to teach you have so many hours in the day but you have to teach so many hours of mm -hmm. the, in the week of a certain topic of a certain mm -hmm. a certain subject but the amount of hours you're supposed to spend exceed the amount of hours mm -hmm. in a school day. Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. who's doing the math there. But how do you compete with that? You know, not every teacher can, can shove that in there. And the budget. They slash sure. and burn budgets, and the first thing to go are trips. And I mean, if it wasn't for PBS, I never would have seen anything. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we've actually... Um, we've developed over, I think we have 15 different education programs so that at every turn you somehow grab somebody. And so we try not to compete, but we actually collaborate with the teachers. We, we actually produce Shakespeare in the, every day in the classroom with field workers in the actual schools so that we're part of the actual classroom experience that's already been allocated to them time-wise. Um, and, and, and then there are student matinee performances for the schools that still do manage to get their kids out on field trips. And then there's after-school programs for the kids that don't have time during the day, so they'll go after school. And then there's summer programs for the kids that want to do stuff in the summer. And, and then they're, you know, so you try to attack from every angle and hope that you reach as many people as possible. And I don't know a single arts institution that's that's not a good one that's not doing massive amount to fill this gap that's happening in our education system the museums the symphonies the ballets the opera companies the theaters I mean everybody that is doing what they can to get arts delivered to the kids and and the the responsibility to take care of that uh, is falling and has been for years on the foundation community and the phil philanthropic community of individuals what we we struggle a lot but do have some success in raising money for 
a program we call No Seats Empty, which is actually the largest numbers of our student matinees are students who come for free and they're paid, for, you know, that are underwritten by by foundations and, and other philanthropists. It's the way to make it happen. In addition to the seats, we look for underwriters who will underwrite the bus. Exactly. So that yeah. these communities can't afford And the workshops and it. the things that go around it and all of that. Yeah. So. But we have to make this a priority in our education system because to rely on nonprofit theaters of varying sizes exactly. <laughs> to invest and try to hunt down these dollars every year, it's hard for us as well. Mm. We enjoy it. It's part of our mission. It's what we're all doing. We know it has to get done. But it has to become integrated in and back into the schools and into our society. Hmm. This. There you go. Oops, sorry. For the as camera, a, Everett. As a former teacher, I would say there is a truism that we do not have to teach poorly to have kids do well on a bad test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk to your Secretary of Education in Washington um, and others like that. And, <laughs> oh, isn't she? <laughs> Do, I think we have time for two more. I, Mr. Christie, see you. Wait, there's oh, one there's here. one over here. Oh, where? Oh, there yeah. you are. And then, Mr. Christie, you're number okay. two. Um, I was wondering, um, in programming your seasons, if there's any fallout from, like, good speed opera dumping bullets over Broadway because it's a Woody Allen, based on a Woody Allen movie and the Me Too movement and the New York Times articles about some of the Broadway show musicals that are coming in. Uh, Henry Higgins bullies Eliza Doolittle and uh, Billy Bigelow hits his wife and she excuses him. Are those things that you have to think about now that you've never had to think about before and how are you handling that? I feel like we've, I mean, I've always been thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, those are things that uh, in any play that I'm reading or um, musical I'm listening to, uh, I'm I'm interested in. Then, uh, you know, the way I program a season is not so much about my interest in a play or not, is is it is my interest in artists and what are they interested in, and I my, I find that that the artists I'm interested in are. Um, are mostly very attuned and sensitive about those kinds of things. So that's just always been part of how yeah, I've approached it. I can just say for a theater that only does new work, we generally we say new plays, and hopefully that's maybe the we go up to like the fourth production of a play. So we're really looking at, at new work. And we're topical because playwrights are writing what they know now. And so, um, you know, as I'm looking for plays for next season, people are writing about it and so so you know we, we we're topical because that's what people are paying attention to right now that being said it's kind of hard to find a comedy right now uh -huh. you know um people there's a lot of stuff that's been going on politically and all that that people really really want to respond to and and you know much to to what bonnie was saying um people either want to escape or jump in and so um from what i have found in 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 recently people are going one of the two ways and so i think it has affected the middle ground a little bit so it's it people are responding and i think theaters are going to end up doing the same just because that's what's getting written um so regarding the positive power of popular culture and the recent wave of diversity and EDI initiatives, how do you ensure that in season programming theater doesn't become tokenized and you don't season plan um, around theater that can be classified like that? Hmm. Um, I'll answer that. Yes, hmm. um, I think that for me the most responsible thing to do, I, I believe that a theater, um, a theater's programming should reflect its audience and so for me I look at my audience and I respond to them so rather than um, you know saying I need to have an african-american play because that's the thing I need to do I look at my audience and I say what are your stories and how can I help tell them um, so you know I, I just I think that the way that you avoid tokenism is to not check off the box, but respond directly. 
if that makes sense. And so that's what uh, I, I've tried to do with my programming for next year. Yeah. yeah. Jim, you're, you're going to. No oh, pressure. Uh, so this has been great, um, really, really uh, informative. I, I had a, when I think of popular culture and theater these days, I just think about how many projects that go forward seem to be films based on films and TV shows. And I just wonder if you guys could speak to that and to the extent that that can crowd out truly new work um, and what you do about that. It's, it's something we struggle with at Paper Mill all the time because it seems like every musical is now based on something else because everybody is writing with the eye to Broadway and what they feel may be commercial success. So, you know, The Sting is based on a movie. Um, then we're doing Halftime, which is not based on anything. It's based on a documentary about uh, seniors who danced at New Jersey Nets games. Um, we did a show last year, The Bandstand, about... Uh, you know, soldiers returning from World War II and dealing with PTSD issues. But we've also done, you know, we're, uh, Honeymoon in Vegas was based on a movie. You know, it just depends. If we think the work is good enough, um, whatever its source material is, you know, West Side Story is certainly based on some good source material. So, you know, if it helps move it and attract an audience to see it, we're not opposed to it, but we also... You know, you struggle with who's, you know, everything it seems to see on Broadway now is uh, Frozen and Harry Potter and, you know, all the big things coming in are, that are sucking up all the air are, you know, based on movies, so. I, I have the advantage that most of the plays we do are so old that everything is based on them instead yeah. of <laughs> Um, I think we'll wrap it up so that everyone can get home safely. Thank you, each yeah. and every one of you, you. for your participation. You. I'm really grateful for that. Um, I hope this inspires you, if you haven't been to any of these theaters, to um, go explore them and see and engage with them. Um, uh, and help sustain them. Uh, thank you so much to John and the Theater Alliance and to the New Jersey Historical Commission for this opportunity. Thank you.